Good evening. Welcome everyone to this session that forms part of Renew's newly expanded Sustainable House Day program. My name is Rob McLeod and I'm the Advocacy and Policy Manager here at Renew. I'll be hosting today's session. I want to begin our session this evening by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the respective lands on which we meet today and pay my respects to their elders past and present. Renew is committed to honouring Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people's unique cultural and spiritual relationships to the land, water and sea and their rich contribution to society. I also recognise that we have people tuned in from all over the country today from a wide variety of traditional lands. Today I'm joining from the Wurundjeri land of the Kulin Nations and, please, and we would love to know where you're tuning in from today so please feel free to share with us by using the chat function. Tonight is the fourth and final session of our Sustainable Renters Week series. And I'd like to take this moment to thank my colleague, James King, Renews Communications and Events Coordinator, who stepped into hosting over the course of the last couple of days while I've been away unwell. I'm so glad that you've decided to join us for this session tonight on improving the rentability and sustainability of your property. Um, tonight, we'll be diving into how you improve the sustainability of a home as a landlord, as um, someone who is renting out Home. Um, the rest of this week has been focused on the perspective of renters, but tonight we're really keen to talk about what you can do as someone who is renting out a home, and we're so glad that you've joined us for this session. This session, which is included as part of our newly formed Extended Sustainable House Day events over the course of, um, of several months leading into Sustainable House Day next year, is supported by many wonderful organisations without, without whom this would not be possible. Um, thank you so much for the support of Natas, Your Home, Design for Place, Bank Australia, Zonin, Lighthouse Architecture and Science, Design Matters, Mary Bank City Council and Banyuil City Council. We thank you all so much for your support. We're also delighted to be joined tonight by a great pair of panellists. Firstly, I'd like to welcome Stan Copan, the CEO of Solar Victoria. Stan is an experienced CEO with a well-regarded track record, successfully delivering high-profile government programs and leading reforms in a number of sectors, including renewable energy, sustainability, health and safety, environmental regulation, and the law. As the CEO of Solar Victoria, Stan is responsible for leading the delivery of the Victorian government's Solar Homes program. Prior to his current role, Stan was the CEO of Sustainability Victoria, where he led a significant expansion and grew the agency's footprint and impact in the areas of climate change, renewables, energy efficiency, and waste and recycling. So thank you so much, Stan. We're so glad to have you with us tonight. We are also, I'm so happy to say, welcome. Um, we are so uh, happy to be joined, should I say, uh, by Renew Local Dick Clark. Dick is Principal of Envirotecture. Is an, is an accredited building designer with over 35 years experience, focusing exclusively on ecologically sustainable and culturally appropriate buildings, as well as sustainable design in vehicles and vessels, and has received many design awards. Dick worked with the late Dr. Chris Reardon and Ms. Cecile Weldon on the livability real estate course, which specifically targeted investor owner landlords with strategies to help retain good tenants by reducing their utility bills and improving their comfort at the same time as reducing the environmental footprint of rental properties. Dick holds Building Designer Accreditation under the Building Designer Accreditation New South Wales Scheme. He is a Director of Sustainability and past President of the New South Wales Chapter of Building Designers Australia, BDA. He is a past President and Board Member of the Association of Building Sustainability Assessors, ABSA. So welcome, Dick. We're so glad to have you with us tonight. So... Those are some introductions, um, and so let's get started. During our discussion, I'll be putting forward viewers' questions to our panel. Um, so thank you to everyone who submitted questions during the registration process. Your questions will inform tonight's discussion. During the session, you can put questions into Zoom's Q and A box at the bottom of your screen, and we'll get to them as many and we'll get to them as much as we can. Hopefully, we can get to all of the questions this evening. Um, we're scheduled to wrap up at seven thirty this evening. You can also use the chat window on the bottom right of the screen to make general comments or to contact our behind the scenes team with any problems. So with no further ado, I will kick off and look in starting a conversation about the role of, um, of people renting out their homes um, in sustainability. I think it's important to lay down the groundwork. Why is it important to improve the sustainability of your tenant and property? Um, so often, 
when we have these conversations for people who are owner occupiers or people who are renting their home, it's pretty obvious um, why there are benefits to improving to improving the sustainability of their property. But why is it something that we should consider for people who are renting out their home? And I'd like to start, I'd like to ask that to both of you on our panel tonight, but I'll start with you, Stan. Look, uh, so many of us uh, rent in, particularly in the larger cities, uh, but also in regional um, Victoria and regional towns all around the uh, the country. And increasingly, whilst uh, I, I guess the current uh, vacancy rates are uh, historically low, there is competition, particularly um, in sort of highly sought after areas. And my view is that you need to make sure that your property is keeping up with what the standards are that people expect. Uh, and increasingly people deserve and uh, expect uh, that the standards of those properties is equivalent to, to those that people own and occupy. Uh, and many people rent for a whole range of reasons, which we won't go into, but in order to, to keep up, I guess, and to make sure that your property is competitive, uh, that it's respectful of your tenants, and obviously a long-term tenant is a good tenant, a stable tenant, uh, that you want to do the right things. And my experience is that um, rental providers do want to do that. And uh, in doing that, that they maintain their properties well. Increasingly, I think in here in Victoria, in particular, rental standards have increased from a legislative perspective Perspective, including minimum standards now around um, uh, heating. Uh, and increasingly, I think they will continue to, to ratchet up would be my view. And uh, upgrading the property to make it energy efficient, to make it more comfortable, uh, obviously more, more livable and attractive. And increasingly, I think what's being sought after is a property that is good value. Uh, and what we know is that solar makes properties good value. Um, it saves the um, the tenant up to $1,000 uh, a, a year uh, on um you know, a freestanding home, for instance, if it's an if it's an apartment, obviously that's a bit more complex. But a unit, it might be sort of five or six hundred. It it instantly reduces the cost of living for those tenants. And what we know is it makes it more attractive. It allows tenants to uh, uh, pay a little bit more, uh, but in the long term, in the longer run, be better off because they've got lower uh, energy prices and a more sustainable home. Fantastic, fantastic. Thank you, Stan. Dick, um, why should people why should people care about making their rented out home sustainable? Yeah, look, um, echoing a lot of what Stan just said, the um, uh, the the issue that we discovered when the livability real estate course was being created and research was being done, uh, and a lot of research was was done into the kind of issues that that come into play for landlords and tenants and that relationship. And ultimately, it's a trading relationship, you know. Um, but the reality is that some outgoings are absolutely unavoidable and non-negotiable. So if your electricity bill, if your electricity account uh, comes in, it's non-negotiable. If you don't pay that, uh, at some point, you will have your power cut off. Um, with tenancy, it's a little bit um, more flexible that you can um, stop paying rent and, and uh, you know, there are means by which tenants can delay the action of being evicted for failing to pay rent. But if they're left with a choice of either paying for the electricity to keep the heating and lighting going or paying the rent, then they will always pay their power bills first and then the rent can get in arrears. And, and that's not a situation that the tenant probably wants to get into and it's certainly not a situation that landlords want their tenants to get into so if it is possible to reduce the outgoings on the utilities it actually increases the reliability of the rent being paid on time so that's a very kind of self-interested view for, for landlords to um you know to take I guess there's the civic minded kind of view of, well, you're reducing the, the carbon footprint and other ecological impacts, um, which make life better for everybody in the long term. Absolutely. And um, look, there, there are many, many reasons that people should be thinking about this. And, you know, um, both, both, um, both, uh, you know, self, self-interest is one part of that, but certainly um, there are good reasons in, on a more broad scale as well. Um, I'll stick with you, Dick, on this on this question. Um, just thinking on in practical terms, once you have made as a landlord a decision to consider the sustainability of your home and want to make those improvements, what 
is the order of priorities that you should be thinking about. At a practical level, what are the sort of things that you should be thinking about first as first steps towards this? Yeah, generally it, it, it aligns pretty much the same as if you're an owner. Um, you, you look for the low-hanging fruit. So now look look for things like ceiling insulation. Uh, it's a bit of a no-brainer and, and it sometimes astounds me that there are still houses out there without any insulation in the ceiling when it's, for most houses, uh, is such an easy thing to fix. Um, so that's a, a straightforward one. That will reduce the tenants' heating bills and with those flow-on effects. Um, interestingly, insulating under the floor in some climate zones is also a really useful thing to do, and it's not that difficult. It's it, it, it's not the sort of thing that uh, necessarily gets talked about over the counter at Bunnings, but um, it, it is something which we have the technology and, and there are lots of trades out there that can do that kind of thing. Um, looking at the solidity of the curtains, especially in colder climates like Melbourne, Hobart, Adelaide, and, and to uh, an extent Sydney as well. Um, so most heat loss through the building perimeter or the building envelope, as we call it, goes through the glass. That's always the, the worst case. And so looking at things like double line curtains in pelmets so that they seal properly and, and can affect as, as if they were double glazed in, you know, almost as good as double glazing. So those are pretty straightforward things. Most houses are going to have curtains anyway. Tenants would like to have privacy, you know, at, at night and so on. So some of those things are really quite easy. Um, hot water is another obvious one. It's a big slice of the pie when we're looking at energy. Um, and so getting off gas is something that, that we at Renew have been pushing for some time now because it's a fossil fuel and, and it's not as clean and green as uh, we've often been led to believe. So swapping out uh, gas or electric storage heaters for efficient heat pump and or solar or solar boosted systems is, um, you know, another easy one. And, and most hot water systems are on a fairly short leash in terms of their longevity anyway. So if they're going to have to be replaced, then look for cost-effective ways of doing it that, with a much more energy-efficient system. Fantastic. There's there's um, so many places to start, and these are really really critical ones. And um, looking at the bang for buck, um, these are some of the big things that people can can absolutely do. Stan, one of the questions that's come up for us a lot from um, people participating tonight is about solar. Basically, um, if you're renting out your home, should you install solar, and how does it work for the for the landlord and the renter? Yeah, sure. Look. Um, the there's probably, I agree with everything Dick said. Um, one of the things to bear in mind is increasingly the homes that you're buying that might be a rental in, in investment, and indeed the one that you might already own, may already have solar. So about 20% of freestanding homes now in Victoria have um, solar. That's increasing. We're projecting 40% by 2025. Most new homes, particularly with um, the Seven Star National Construction Code coming into force next year, certainly the lead up to that is attracting a lot of a lot of attention. And we're seeing this really progressive and I'd say almost aggressive <laughs> um, marketing from volume home builders and some of the, uh, you know, the the sort of uh, front runners, uh, your Mervax, your lend leases in the in the sort of both. Uh, uh, volume home building as well as uh, build to rent uh, markets now marketing themselves as much more sustainable, all electric and including solar as standard. And we're seeing that, um, uh, that a lot more. So I would have agreed with um, uh, everything that Dick said in terms of the order of your investments, except if you've already got solar, because then I think you're thinking about how do we maximise? And what we know from our customers at Solar Homes uh, is that everybody wants to maximise the benefit of their solar. And the best way to do that is to use the power yourself, right? So self-consumption. So that means in Victoria, at least, converting your heating, your home heating, your space heating into electric. Uh, so we call it a heat pump, reverse cycle air conditioner, and then hot water, either or, it doesn't really matter. You're going to save money both ways as long as you're using your own um, solar. So I'd probably start on that. The, the second piece is that um, solar is increasingly popular as a, uh, a kind of uh, an attribute to a home that people are buying and more and more a home that they're renting as well because 
we've just kind of grown to accept that it's beneficial uh, and that it'll pay for itself uh, ultimately. And so we're seeing, particularly in those suburbs, you know, we've got a program that will service over its uh, life. We're in our fifth year of solar homes. Uh, we'll serve more than three quarters of a million Victorians uh, with solar uh, rebates and zero interest loans. 50,000 of uh, those are reserved for uh, rental properties. Um, and so that's a $1,400 rebate here in Victoria on a new PV system. And then we'll match that with a $1,400 zero interest loan. So that's $2,800 upfront. Uh, you can now in Victoria under the Residential Tenancies Act split that loan repayment. So that's about $14 a month if it's the uh, if it's the rental provider or landlord to, is going to split that. We find that only about half of uh, our customers take that option up, and uh, of that, only half of them pass on the cost to their to their renters. And for me, what that indicates is that. You know, these early adopters, if you like, in the rental markets are doing it because they know that it makes sense and it makes their property more marketable. Uh, interestingly, um, there's some work that's been done by uh, Domain that indicates that the average premium on a home that's considered sustainable and number one attribute being solar, number one search term, if you like, on those search engines, um, it sells for on average $125,000 more uh, than homes that don't market themselves in that way. So there's actually this kind of capital uh, appreciation. Obviously, the investment itself uh, is um, is tax deductible, tax, deduct tax deductible. Sorry, as a capital outlay. So there's kind of all of these benefits. Plus, it makes sense because it makes your property more your more more, more marketable, if you like. Yeah. Okay. So it's not just the interest from renters who want to rent out a home with that, but it's also knowing that there's this capital investment that one day, if you do end up selling your home, then you'll be getting a higher price for it at the end of the day. Absolutely. And we know people are proud of their their investment properties. You know, many in many cases, their superannuation uh, depends on it, or it's a part of the nest egg that they want to uh, kind of uh, use at some point or, or share with their their children's friends and family. You know, and uh, obviously capital improvement is something that's pretty attractive and you can do that with these uh, additional features. The other thing is future proofing. Yeah, okay, okay. No, excellent, excellent. Well, just on this question of demand for sustainable rental homes. Um, so we've had, uh, we've had three sessions this week of people who are coming to find out about how they can make their own rental home more sustainable. But I'm really interested in this question. This might be for either of you on the panel, so please feel free to jump in. But do we know a lot about how much demand there is from renters for a sustainable home? You know, will it make your home stand out if you're trying to rent it out on the market? Uh, if I could, I can't say, uh, Dick, but look, it's a tough one, really, because uh, it, this market has been pretty dynamic. You know, if you'd asked me this question in 2020, uh, I reckon people would have been doing anything to secure a, a, a tenant, uh, obviously, with the economic uh, uncertainty that was caused in that first year of lockdowns and, and pandemic, you know, um, people moving in with each other and moving back home or moving back to uh, to the regions where they came from, all of this sort of stuff, it, you know, tenancy rates, vacancy rates, I should say, up to, up to about 10% and people reducing their um, rentals. Now, um, in that sort of a market, you want to compete, right? Um, and in many cases, lowering rent. Uh, at this end, uh, I'd be saying something quite different because uh, in most of Melbourne, ten, uh, uh, vacancy rates are at about 1%, which is historically low, particularly the closer you you get towards inner in Melbourne. I think the economics still stack up, but it's uh, at this case, at this uh, stage of the cycle, I think something about scarcity where um, tenants are really um, pretty desperate to find, find a home. I think the economics still stack up and the investment is worth it for those reasons that I was talking about. It won't always be this way. You know, we're putting on 40,000 new homes each year in Victoria. Uh, increasingly, apartments are competitive and more attractive, newer often than freestanding homes, particularly in that inner and middle ring. Um, and you want to be competitive in that market. And in my view, 
you'll be competing against properties that are more sustainable and have the solar and that are cheaper to run, more comfortable to live in, all of those things that we know about sustainability features. Uh, the one thing I'd say is perhaps just to dispel uh, some myths is in terms of, you know, we're a few years into our program with solar homes, uh, we've serviced about 260,000 Victorians um, now in that time uh, with a variety of technologies. So obviously we do solar, we do batteries, hot water, um, and uh, reverse cycle heat um, pumps as well. Um, solar being the, the predominant one. Our most popular suburb in Melbourne is Tarnay in the outer southeast, uh, southwest, sorry, of Melbourne. Um, uh, Clyde North in the outer south uh, east, about 45 kilometres or so from, from Melbourne, and Craigieburn. And in those markets, uh, you're talking about solar penetration rates of 40 to 50 percent so in order mm. to compete whether it's a rental or a home that eventually you might sell or buy etc people are looking for those features because that's what their neighbors have got um, and so to stay competitive in that market you've got to be thinking about solar and obviously the victorian government has kind of backed that in uh, with this pretty pretty generous offer in terms of both rebates and and zero interest loans mm. The, the situation in other regions is pretty dire at the moment in terms of availability. So if you could measure uh, vacancy rates, uh, they'd be in the negative percentages at the moment in, in quite a number of regions, the northern rivers of New South Wales, for instance, southeast Queensland. Um, so if, in, in those areas and, and parts of Sydney, um, in those areas, it's a case of get whatever you can. And so I think we we're seeing some pretty dodgy things happening there and, and that's not good. Um, mm. I've personally um, seen people just literally taking up residence in a local park with a, um, a small caravan and a, a tarp for an annex. And, and, and these are people on, on quite reasonable money with nine to five jobs, you know, they're, they're, these are not jobless, homeless. Well, they're homeless, but um, you know, they're, they're the the options to rent a house are simply not there. There are none available. So it at the moment, it, it's not a good situation. And I guess a cynical landlord might say, well, yeah, why would I bother? Uh, I can rent this house three times over without doing anything. Yes, maybe you can this year, but next year, maybe not. And, uh, you know, situations change. Things happen in cycles. Um, so what happens in the future is anybody's guess, but more importantly, if you're wanting to to position your your um, uh, I guess you know think of it as a product in the marketplace, if you're wanting to position yourself in a way that puts you in leadership, uh, so that you've got the most saleable product, the most rentable house, whatever wherever it may sit in the price pile of houses. So I'm not talking about you know, top of the price pile. I'm just saying if, you know, wherever it sits in, in the demographic, if you want to be in a leadership position, then invest whenever the opportunity comes up to, you know, if it's a, a an opportunity to renovate between tenants and you can do some of these things to make it a better house, then, then do it uh, because it's going to be a good investment in the long term. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. I'm going to jump into some of the questions that we've had coming in from people um, during the session and before as well. Um, one of the, so this is a question from Jane. What are the key pieces of information that the investor or landlord will need to flesh out, um, will need in order to flesh out the business case for spending on structural changes to the dwelling? So what what bits of information or what things should someone be considering before they before they make the plunge to making some upgrades? Um, once again, I, I'm directing this at the entire panel, so I'm sorry. Please feel free to jump in. Um, well, I jump I guess, in? okay. The, the first thing I guess would, would be to consider what approvals may be necessary. Uh, do you need a uh, a DA in, in you know, planning approval? Um, these terms vary from state to state. So, you know, speaking nationally, let's call it planning approval, so development application or planning permit. Um, or do you just need a, a building permit in Victorian lingo or a, a construction development certificate in New South Wales lingo, et cetera? Um, but those, those are the questions. First, you don't want to do something that is going to be uh, illegal building work. Most of the stuff that we've been talking about as the low-hanging fruit requires no approvals at all. 
Um, so it, it is only going to be something a bit more substantial that would require that, but it's always worth just checking. Absolutely, absolutely. As Sorry, Stan, and then I'll jump into the related question. Look, I was just going to say, for most of the things that we've been talking about so far don't require a building permit. Having said that, if you're renovating your property, obviously that's an opportunity. And in fact, uh, most people, when they are renovating, are starting to think about more sustainable features. So whether it's double glazing, whether it's um, kind of how you how do you orient the uh, extension and how sustainable it is, obviously insulation now mandatory um, and starting to think about, particularly if it's a larger extension or, or renovation, how, do you, how are you going to get that to six or, or seven stars, particularly in um, uh, in Melbourne. Uh, for solar, generally you won't need uh, a permit, but you, you know, obviously if you're going to apply for a, a rebate, there's a certain process. Our website, solar.vic.gov.au has all of the information. I'd start with friends and family, something as simple as that. Um, many of us have solar, many of us have renovated, many of us have made now uh, improvements that they benefit from uh, in terms of some of those energy efficiency features in particular. Um, and uh, that's a good way to navigate a, a, a market that's really unfamiliar to us. Most of us have bought a fridge or another appliance. Very few of us have actually bought solar. And I see one of the questions is how long is it going to last? It'll generally last you about 20 years. The inverter might last you 10 to 20. Um, but what we're finding, in fact, is that that first generation of solar investors, particularly in that inner and middle ring of, uh, of, uh, of inner city Melbourne, Sydney, Brisbane, et cetera, the largest cities, um, is now thinking about upgrading its solar um, and solar and batteries increasingly becoming, uh, becoming more popular uh, as well. So that's, a, that's an opportunity, I guess, as well. Yeah, okay, okay. On the question of lifespans of um of appliances, I've got a I've got this question here. If gas hot water systems need replacing, what life could I expect from solar hot water system? Um Dick, could I throw this one to you and also just add on to that question? What are the things that are going to last longest? You know, what are the are there are there timings and lifespans of appliances something that the landlord should be considering? Yeah, they're really good questions. Uh it it depends on proximity to, to coastal conditions for a lot of these things. So any piece of equipment that's outside is not going to last as long if you're anywhere within, uh, you know, sort of two or three k's of the coast uh, and, and even closer than that can be quite short lifespans. And so the the material that things are made of and, and how many moving parts they have should be considered. Um, generally, uh it's a combination of finding the sweet spot, I guess, between the the uh, the complexity and longevity uh, versus the efficiency of the system, and 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 then the the kind of third part of that triangle is the cost of installation. So, using hot water as an example, um, hot water that's very efficient and has no moving parts would be, say, an evacuated tube system with a little circulation pump on a, a tank that where the tank is perhaps mounted inside the building to reduce heat loss and so on. That's going to be a very long-lived system. The only moving part is the circulation pump, the evac tubes, uh, although a really, really severe hailstorm I have I know has broken some tubes. Um, that was hail the size of literally of cricket balls. Most hailstorms uh, don't touch them at all. So, you know, you can basically say it's hail proof. That, that system is, however, going to cost a lot more to install than, say, um, a heat pump. Um, but then the heat pump is a lot of moving parts and it's got a bit of equipment that's sitting outside. Will that heat pump last for um, more than 10 or 15 years? Um, maybe. It probably won't last 15 without some kind of service being done on it. And, and, and I'd suggest that if you got 10 out of it without having to have any service, you'd be doing okay as well. Um, the the life of the tank uh, in that instance, you know, you'd, you'd say, well, let's go for a stainless tank because that's got an almost unlimited life as long as it's looked after. Um, whereas if you compared it, say, to instantaneous gas, uh, they have been known to corrode in between five and eight years, so that's fairly short, but um, it you know, it, 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 if it's replacing an existing system, then the the cost of that adaptation has to be taken into account as well. And and the the problem we have there is that when a, an old hot water system um, fails, 
the easy thing to do is just stick another one of the same back in because there's no other adaptation cost involved. Uh, in the case of gas instantaneous, that, you know, from our point of view of trying to get carbon emissions down across the board, um, that is a real problem. Um, so where the, the adaptation cost gets factored in needs to be, you know, fall through. And, and I guess you just need a little bit of uh, non-partisan expert advice to to find the best solution. Um, you know that old saying that to a hammer every problem looks like a nail. Um, if you deal with a, a plumber, for instance, who has a particular relationship with a, a particular kind of hot water supply, they might not give you unbiased, uh, you know, level technical advice. So it's it's important to seek out advice that is unbiased. Yeah, that's um, and that's always a critical thing. We would always say get some get some advice, get someone who um can have a look at it or can tell you um, you know what's going on in the best best unbiased advice, as you say, Dick. So absolutely, I have a couple of questions here. Um, really about um what it means for tenants who are living in a home um, and what their rights are around this. So basically the question is, and I might start with you here on the stand, but Dick, feel free to jump in as well. Um, can I do? Can I make upgrades on the home while it's tenanted, while there are people living in there? What do I need to do to talk with them or get or get agreement? Do I need to get agreement? I guess. So, what, where do where do people stand? Yeah, it's a great question. Look, um, the starting point in Victoria would be for a two. Um, uh, the, in order to tenant your property, that there's now minimum standards for heating, uh, which is a great development. You know, I, I think we can all remember things like student um, housing, etc., where you had no heater, or in many cases still in inner Melbourne, people are heating their homes with um, open fireplaces, which is, you know, terrible from an efficiency perspective, really uncomfortable and lo and localized, uh, expensive often, and uh, obviously bad for for air quality and the environment as well. So I guess uh, the government um, uh, last. Last year reformed the Residential Tenancies Act to require at least two star efficiency in terms of um, heating. Uh, and uh, so in many cases, whether they're apartments or um, or homes, reverse cycle air conditioning will be the most efficient for the tenant. It's pretty cost effective and there are still, uh, there's a rebate program that we administer that covers both um, owner occupiers and um, uh, tenancies for uh, upgrading reverse cycle air conditioners. There's a bit extra, it's a thousand dollars uh, as a rebate, it goes up to 1700 if you're upgrading a switchboard or, or replacing gas. Um, the tenant should be insisting on that because that's that's what the law requires if it's not already in, in place. Um, Beyond that, um, we encourage uh, tenants and and uh, landlords, uh, to use that term, to have a conversation about upgrading uh, properties. If it is a request from the tenant uh, for for solar, there's no mandatory requirement, as far as I'm aware, anywhere in the country, but particularly not here in Victoria, but it is a negotiation. Um, and obviously we've tried to make that a little bit easier um, and we provide tools for tenants to approach their landlord or their property manager. Generally, they're not you know, in a great relationship with their landlord directly, they're not communicating directly through a property manager. And we've worked really closely with the um, REIV and property managers as well to promote our program. So there's a range of tools that they can put to the landlord, make them aware of the offer, um, you know, uh, if they're prepared to to contribute to the um, to the loan repayments, that can make it a bit of a sweetener as well. And then obviously the, the landlord will ultimately benefit from the capital e improvement. The tenant can't make this sort of an adjustment to the home without the landlord's consent, that's pretty clear. Um, and the asset would uh, ultimately pass to the, uh, to the landlord. The reverse though is also true. Something like um, putting in solar will generally require access to the switchboard or will mean some of the power, uh, the power will go out for a short period of time and obviously be a bit of an inconvenience. In that case, again, the opposite is true. Landlord should be consulting their, their tenants and seeking agreement. In under our program, there's a, a means test that's placed on the tenant, um, which is uh, a combined income of less than $180,000. Um, about 80% of rental properties go to people who earn less than that. So you're pretty, 
you're pretty um, likely to be eligible. But what we do require is a, a tenancy agreement um, in place, so the head agreement, if you like, the lease, um, uh, to make sure that the tenant is protected in those circumstances. And then we provide a rental uh, provider statement that is signed both by the rental provider and the um, the tenant um, that confirms their income. We don't require any um, uh, confirmation documents or tax returns or anything like that. We've really eased that process, but they do need to sign a declaration to say that they're within the threshold. Um, and then with that agreement, that provides the consent for the landlord then to go and uh, to undertake the works. Yeah. yeah, okay. Just out of curiosity, I'm just pure personal curiosity, do you get many cases of um, where the landlord wants to make improvements or install solar and the, and the tenant it refuses it? Uh, I haven't heard of one, but having said that, it's <laughs> unlikely that it would have come to us as an application. Um, we've had about 4,000 uh, homes now upgraded with solar that are rental um, rental properties, um, and we hear, hear great things. You know, the number one reason is obviously to save money, whether you're a landlord or a tenant or, or an owner occupier. Um, for investors, we allow them to uh, access as long as they're eligible, obviously, the rebate and the loan for their own home, and then up to two rental properties um, a year. So it's a pretty attractive proposition uh, for an investor or a, or a landlord, and. Um, yeah, we try and make it as easy as possible as well. Yeah, fantastic, fantastic. I've got a, a few questions have come in about um, specifically heating, really, and I might group these together and throw them to you first, Dick. Um, so one here, and a question from an anonymous attendee. Um, suggestions, please, to electrify the heating of my 1930s built rental property. Um, currently, central gas heating with registers in floor. I'm keen to be able to reuse those if possible. Though I've been told that heating only heat pumps are not available and cooling requires larger ducts, which won't be done to the floor. So there's some um, there's some detail in there. Um, not keen to have registers in the ceiling um, because of decorative plaster work or through solid masonry walls. There are three fireplaces. Are electric fireplaces any good? So I guess um, there's specific, it points to lots of specific issues that you can have in a specific home of what's going to be the best fit for the home aesthetically and, um, and um, and performance wise. Um, just related to that, um, with the two star, now that a two star requirement has been set in Victoria, um, will that mean that ducted heating is gone altogether? Um, can people still install ducted heating? Um, finally, I might just, in, in terms of all of these heating questions, um, I might throw to you first, Dick, about um, what do you think people should be considering in, in terms of replacing heating? Um, and then Stan will ask a follow-up question about some specifics of the Victorian program. But but Dick, to you first. Okay. So um, the the issue with uh, with using air conditioning for heating, it, it is very energy efficient. Um, but that's a relative term, I guess. Ducted aircon in most instances where you've got the uh, the fan coil unit um, in the roof space outside of the and, and it's assumed that people have done the right thing and insulated the uh, the building that would normally happen at the ceiling level so that's your kind of red line of thermal control and then you've got this device sitting up there in a very hot and and cold space with generally pretty poorly insulated ducting and the ducting is often very inefficient in terms of its um the way it handles the air because they're often convoluted and have tight corners and poorly installed um, so it, that's the problem with ducted aircon that that it, it it's just generally not as efficient as uh, split systems. Now split systems have this aesthetic issue that nobody really enjoys seeing a plastic box on the wall, um, and so we've got this kind of wrangling going on. And uh, so it it's it can be a, a situation where if you're trying to, especially in a, a building with some heritage values, if you're trying to to do something that's a, a bit sympathetic as you should, to the, the character of the building is finding appliances that can be incorporated into other uh, parts of the building, like into joinery, bulkheads above cupboards and so on, so that the, the discrete um, grill is all it's seen rather than the plastic box on the walls. But it, it's very much a um, you know case-by-case -case kind of situation uh, in, in those instances. There's no... Um, one, you know, I can't kind of point to something and say, always use these. It just, uh, it's not that simple. So you've really got to look at it, you know, on a case by case and come up with a, an individual solution. 
Yeah, yeah, no, that's and the other, the other thing I would say also, just in, in terms of heating and cooling, just to, to throw one in there, which um, is, that ceiling fans are still the single most useful bit of equipment I think you can put into a building. They're fantastic for summer. They're also useful for, for winter. Uh, where they should be spun in reverse at a very low speed. So you de-stratify the air, stop all the warm air gathering at the ceiling level, bring it back down to where the people are, uh, and but do it at uh, slow speed so there's no kind of velocity of air perceived and therefore a wind chill effect. But in summer, um, they should also always be run in conjunction with aircon. So it should never be either ceiling fans or aircon. It should be ceiling fans. Oh, and aircon, then ceiling fans with the aircon. Uh, the reason for that is the ceiling fans are very good in downdraft mode, summer mode, at moving air across the whole space, around the whole volume of a room, much more efficiently than a little slit in the wall or a plastic box on the wall. The, the aircon is great at chilling and taking humidity out of the air, uh, but if it's coupled with a ceiling fan that moves it much more effectively around the place, you can actually reduce your energy demand on the aircon by a factor of four. Uh, this is a trick that came from the top end. We discovered it less than 20 years ago, but it, we're, we're applying it universally across the whole of Australia because it just works in the different seasons. I, I think so many people don't know about that as well. I think that not many people think that that's how, that that's how to use these appliances. But, um, you know, I, I, you know I, I wish more people did. In, in new buildings, we set it up so that the aircon's power circuit is slave to the ceiling fans. People turn the aircon on without the ceiling fan going, it won't run. Turn the ceiling fan on first. Make the ceiling fan do as much as it can for as long as it can before you even need the aircon. So, you know, once again, it's just, it's not only about reducing emissions, it's about increasing comfort and, and reducing um, energy costs for tenants. Yeah, fantastic. So, um, yeah, all of those benefits go together. Stan, I am um, so on the question of heaters. In and the, this is, is a somewhat Victorian specific issue, um, but there there are some relevances to other states. So Victoria has introduced this minimum standard for heaters, which um, and requirement of a fixed heater, which um, we agree with you. It's something we've pushed for. It's something we're delighted with. Having personally having lived through enough Melbourne winters in rental homes with no fixed heaters at all, I know very much um, all of the benefits to this. Um, this is something so. Landlords will need to install heaters if it's not there, but also are potentially eligible for um, a rebate through um, the Home Heating and Cooling Program. Would, would I be able to ask you just to talk us through um, concretely what people need to do about that or how, the, how that works? Yeah, so the first thing is to start with our website, solar.vic.gov.au. All of our programs, including solar, solar for renters, home heating and cooling upgrades, hot water at, and, and batteries. At this stage, we don't do hot water and batteries for rental properties. The government's kind of held that line around owner occupiers. But the first two, both um, solar and um, home heating and cooling, which, as I said, is a reverse cycle um, heat pump, which is replacing either a gas system, a gas space heater, no heating, uh, as I think uh, you're alluding to, uh, Rob, um, or a, um, a, you know, a fireplace or, or similar. If it's a gas space heater, we offer an incentive. In, and in fact, we require the gas space heater to be decommissioned. Um, and that's obviously because of the emissions offset and, and sort of... Um, uh, future-proofing the home, if you like, and getting people off gas and onto electricity. They'll generally, um, the tenant will benefit from about $300 a year um, off a gas space heater, uh, which is costing them more, and increasingly it'll cost them more and more. Um, so for many of us now, electricity is a, is a worry, but it's not our biggest worry. In Melbourne, Canberra, um, Adelaide in particular, you're worried about gas bills, right? Um, because it's how you're heating your home in most cases and it's how you're heating uh, water. Probably less so uh, in New South Wales and obviously the, the further north you go, it's, it, it's warmer. Um, so that's where I'd start. I'd start with friends and family and their experience. Um, uh, in terms of the, the logistics of it, it's all online. Uh, we can do um, offline um, sort of uh, by post uh, applications, but generally people prefer to do it online. The heating and cooling uh, program, the applicant will get a token and then they go to one of our approved suppliers. We've got about 120 across the state, including some big box 
retailers as well as very small businesses and you can take your pick. You can shop around, get a quote. Um, and as I say, the rebate is between $1,000 and $1,700. That's paid to the supplier, uh, but obviously for the benefit of the, the landlord who's paying the, the, um, uh, the difference. At, at this stage, about 15% of those um, upgrades have been to, to rental properties. Um, I'd probably echo a lot of what um, Dick has said, and, and Dick's obviously the expert in terms of um, uh, the, uh, I, I guess, mechanics of how buildings work and, and, and how to upgrade them. I think we've got a long way to go, and it's fantastic to see the audience that we've got in uh, on on the call uh, tonight, and obviously the level of engagement that you get through Renew. It's not. Uh, as easy as we'd like. And I think the industry as a whole has a long way to go. So uh, we're doing some work around training um, and support for the industry as well, particularly around plumbers and encouraging plumbers to educate themselves. We're doing that through the Plumbing Industry uh, Climate Action Centre um, to educate plumbers and kind of demystify how heat pumps work. Heat pumps are the most efficient form of um, uh, of water heating uh, and uh, particularly popular, obviously, and increasingly popular in South Australia and Victoria, but they're not particularly easy and plumbers aren't um, all that familiar with them. And so if you, you're a plumber who's a gas fitter um, and you're putting in uh, hot water, for most of us, uh, if the hot water breaks down, you're going to want something really quick. Mm. Um, and in most cases, that'll be an instantaneous gas. And that's probably the worst thing that you can do from a climate perspective and emissions perspective, but in the long run, uh, both from a costs uh, perspective and a future per uh, um, uh, perspective um, as well. And so heat pumps uh, is where I'd start. You, at this stage, you'll need to shop around, but increasingly we'll start um, to see more plumbers, more familiar, more literate with them, more comfortable to re recommend their replacement. And indeed a supply chain that's a bit more resilient. And there are some, there is some interest from local manufacturers, et cetera, which is another thing that we're really keen uh, to encourage. Uh, on the heating front, it could be the same. It's often really tempting to replace like for like. I don't think we've seen, as one of the questions has uh, suggested, the end of ducted uh, heating just yet. Um, obviously, uh, in Victoria, we're really fortunate to have a, a kind of industry and, and uh, residential market uh, market indication from the government through the gas substitution roadmap, which ultimately, in a nutshell, says that the future for homes is all electric and getting off gas increasingly. So for 2 million of us, that means starting to, over time, as we renovate, as we upgrade appliances at end of life, starting to replace them with electric uh, appliances. And obviously, if you've got solar, then you're optimising that. Hopefully that gets to the to the question, Rob, but uh, I'm not gonna say it's easy, in particular if you're talking about a heritage home and lots of us want convenience, whether we've got the hydronic heating, which generally is, ga is gas, the electric heat pump uh, is a little bit more expensive, but I think the market will transform pretty quickly. We know that this is the critical decade. Um, all of our homes really need to be upgraded uh, in the next 10 years. How we do that, obviously, and at what time and at what rate and that sort of thing uh, will vary, but we need an industry that's prepared to meet that challenge. And, and, and my view is if the market signals are right, the demand is there, the industry will respond. Yeah, yeah. It's um, we certainly um know that. Oh, it's it's so good to hear about what's going on with the plumbing, with the plumbing industry, and with the plumbing sector. People, um, we know that that's an area along with along with you know having spoken with um, electrical trades union as well, um, and people working in the space, um, you know, have a very strong stake in this, and we need to we need to make sure that um we're building social license for this to happen and working with the industry on that. So it's, it's, it's a critical, critical part of the picture. Just on the, um, talking about the energy bills um, side of things, I just give a, I just give a note that Renew has released a report this week um, that models the um, expected cost rises to homes, including renters um, between now and 2022, um, depending on what type of heating they're using and whether there's insulation in the home. Um, people using gas heaters and particularly people who don't have good insulation and good thermal efficiency will face bigger cost increases um, than people who are using have all electric homes or are connected to solar between now and 2024. And um, there is there is a strong evidence base on that. Um, I do have a couple of just just talking about the market side of things and Stan, I'll, I'll, I see you're off mute, so I'll, I'll um, let you jump into that as well. But um, 
I'll just add in an extra question um, as we go. And that is around the market, um, basically the market for these things as well. People are asking, how do I advertise for this? And are there is the real estate industry interested in this question? And are there real estate agents who particular, you know, are there, are there specialist real estate agents who want to talk about this? Or is there knowledge in the real estate sector about um, renting out sustainable homes? Yeah, you know, I might defer to to you on this one, Dick. The one thing I'd say though is that um, both uh, Domain and realestate.com have been really progressive in this area and have done have issued some reports around sustainability features and search terms. And it is possible to list your home and your rental with sustainability features. And we're seeing increasingly that's really popular, particularly on the outskirts of Melbourne because people are so uh, aware. And my view is that if Domain and realestate.com are doing it, then uh, your agent will be interested as well. Yeah, it's... It had a really um, big start a couple of years ago with the Centre for Livability Real Estate, uh, and I'll post a link to that in the chat, um, that to, was started with Chris Reardon and Cecile Weldon, as you mentioned in the intro. Uh, and it started with Enel J Hooker. And uh, look, long story short, the CSIRO took over the program. Uh, and the idea of that is that it trains real estate agents in being able to recognise sustainability features in a building, understand the potential benefit that they offer the occupants, and then to be able in very short order to communicate those benefits to punters when they walk through the door. And this applies to both sales and rental, that, that when people come to do a rental inspection, they can say, look, here's the double glazing. That means you're not going to shiver in winter, provided you don't do something stupid like leave the windows open. Um, and, and so that that uh, kind of training that is offered through that uh, that course, they they have a, a thing called the list of 17 things, or it's actually called the 17 things. And these are features that an when they, the estate agent's doing an appraisal of the building, they can tick them off and, and they understand, having done the training, what those things are and, and how they work. So that one's um, quite, I think at last count there were five or 600 agents around the country around the Australia that had done the training and a proportion of those are just property management specialists so they're all they're doing is is managing rental properties so they're out there uh, it'd be great to for landlords to seek them out and say hey I've done these things to my property they're going to provide extra value to tenants can you handle this property for me and communicate those I should get a little bit more rental return on them the tenant's going to spend less, an equivalent amount less on their outgoings and everybody should be happy. Yeah, fantastic. I think, um, yeah, is I mean, is there a way to locate those people? Is there somewhere people can go to find them? Yeah, I just put a, a link in the chat to livability.com.au um, and, and that's the, the whole website, but there are sections of that website that that deal with the, uh, the tenancy side of things. And yes, you can seek out uh, the specialists in in a geographical area. I think there's a, a 50 kilometre, uh, defaults to a 50 kilometre radius of whichever address you're looking at. Oh, fantastic, fantastic. Um, that's great. That's great to know. I think there's a real opportunity there for people in the industry as well as people who are, as well as people who are renting out their home. I have, um, so we're coming up into the last 10 minutes of the session and so I'm keen to get to as many of the questions as I can. One of them is about apartments um so are there specific things that um people who are renting out uh, you know apartments um do make up a large section section of the rental housing market particularly in particularly in some locations um are there particular things that um that people renting out apartments um should be considering specifically and i guess that gets into a question in a lot of cases as well about questions of um of strata management or body corps, um, and so in a situation where you're dealing with a strata, with um, you know a landlord tenant relationship that's not just between those parties, but also including a body corp or you know um, another tenancy arrangement, are there things that should be considered there? Um, Dick, can I stick? I'll stick with you. Sure. Look, we we've had a bit of experience with this, both good and bad. <laughs> um, we had a a landlord who was a, a national organisation that I probably should not name, they're a good organisation, they had the best intentions. They were bequeathed a unit that uh, had some horrendous issues to do with the condensation and poor thermal performance and so on. 
And um, they said, you know, this is, and, and they actually got taken to court by the tenant who got quite sick from mould. And they said, look, this isn't a good look for, for us. You know, we're all about conservation and, and looking after the planet. Um, what can we do? So uh, we, we did a renovation on that unit. We had to tackle the body corporate. We had to assure the body corporate that when we replaced the windows and doors with double glazing, that from the outside, they would look exactly the same as all of the windows and doors in this um, block of units of you know 70 or 80 units. And, and then we had to assure them that other things that we were doing would not interfere with um, the way that the, the body corporate was concerned, you know, the, the, the issues that, that concern the, the owner's corporation. So, yeah, there are hoops that have to be jumped through and they can be. And in that instance, the end result was that at the end, the, the owner's corporation said, that's fantastic. That is now the model for anyone doing renovations in this block of units to follow. So, you know, we kind of kicked the door down and, and hopefully um, a whole bunch of other units that have been renovated since have followed through. Um, some things have got harder, though. So in New South Wales, multi-storey residentials being class two buildings under the National Construction Code, the Building Code of Australia, now are subject to very, very tight um, constraints around who can design and, and build things in them. Uh, this was following from um, the Opal Towers and Mascot Towers that got a fair bit of coverage a couple of years ago when they uh, developed some issues. Um, that The flow on from that means now that it's it's not so easy to do upgrades to multi-res uh, situations in New South Wales. Now, I guess the, 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 the changes, the legislative changes were done with the best of intent to maintain high standards and, and high levels of safety. The, the kind of downside is that the number of people who are now able to do that design engineering and um, and construction work is much, much smaller, which makes it much less competitive and therefore harder. Uh, I don't know whether those things are going to flow through ultimately to the other states or not, but um, yeah, there it is. Uh, okay, okay. And, but yeah, um, key, key issues, really, really big issues and, you know, um, that will resonate in other locations as well, I think. I'm conscious that we've got only a few minutes left and I'm keen to get to one more question before we get to the wrap up. Um, and this one, I'll start with you on this, Stan. Um, we've had a couple of questions have come in um, about basically how charging works for solar. So um, as in who gets the benefit to it? Um, do can, can landlords charge a price to the tenants? Do tenants get all of the benefits or do landlords get all of the benefits? Basically, how does, how does paying the solar or the, or the feed-in tariffs actually work in practice? Yeah, so look, this is one of the challenges, obviously, with any upgrade to a rental property, what we call the split incentive. The, the landlord has to invest in order to upgrade the property, the benefits flow to the tenant. It's traditionally been the, the barrier to some of these uh, improvements. Having said that, you know, the, the rebates that I've talked about and zero interest loans are trying to break that mould, if you like, and really kind of push the landlord towards the investment by making it, um, uh, you know, obviously cheaper and, and more attractive up front. It's not mandatory that they pass on the costs of the um, zero interest loan uh, that we provide, uh, but it reduces the upfront cost of the investment. They put the solar on, um, and if it's a freestanding home or a unit that's got the solar, um, that will feed into the, the meter via diverter and obviously um, pass on the rest of the grid. Everything that's used in the home will be for the benefit of the tenant. Everything that's exported, obviously, again, um, uh, paid back to, to the tenant as long, long as the tenant's paying the bills. That's not universally the case, but in, in most cases, that'll be the case. Our feeding tariff is about five cents per, um, per kilowatt hour in, in Victoria. But as I said earlier, self-consumption is the game um, and that'll save them $1,000. So uh, that's kind of um, how it works. You can't pass on the costs of the solar under the Residential Tenancies Act. And in fact, the amendment that we pursued about uh, three years ago in order to put in place the arrangement that I've talked about where the tenant contributes to the capital uh, cost of the loan uh, is a specific exemption um, that allows them to contribute. Ordinarily in Victoria, at least, the Residential Tenancies Act prohibits um, the pass through of infrastructure costs to 
uh, to tenants by the landlord. The exception is just that zero interest loan for the solar homes program. It's quite a specific amendment. Uh, and that's obviously to protect tenants, right? Because they're not responsible for the infrastructure and upgrades. That's the, um, the landlord's responsibility. Um, and for that reason as well, <clears throat> it's not prohibited to charge more from a rental perspective. And indeed there's some work out of WA and the US that says that um, more sustainable properties, particularly those that solar uh, charge a, a premium, slight premium on, um, on their rent. Uh, but obviously there's a benefit there to the tenant. It's one of the advantages, but also obviously for the tenant could be a, could be a disadvantage. Yeah, yeah. And, and look, protecting tenants' rights in, in through all of this is, of course, a really, really critical part that I'm sure will be, um, you know, is central, is central to how we should be thinking about all of this. Yeah, absolutely. And look, Rob, I, I think, and, you know, Victoria, we've just come out of an election, huge uh, advocacy on, on all sides and, and by the peak bodies and NGOs in the, in the tenant the tenancy sector, uh, if you like, around the role of tenants, you know, in inner city Melbourne, Yarra, for instance, 50% of us rent. Um, and so it's a market segment that needs support um, and on which there's uh, plenty of discussion, I think, on what that might look like, whether it's on the uh, housing stock side, whether it's on the um, protection of tenants' rights, as I said, where there's been huge reforms here in, in Victoria, or indeed whether it's to make those homes more comfortable and more sustainable over time as well. And I don't expect that that would um, go away anytime soon. I think, you know, we'll be talking about these things for for, for many years. There are also, without going into too much detail and hogging up too much of your time, Rob, in Victoria at least, um, uh, amendments recently to the Owners Corp Act prohibit Owners Corps from um, unreasonably denying an OC member uh, from getting solar. Um, and it's now, uh, the threshold is relaxed. It's now no longer a special resolution, which is a two thirds majority resolution. It's now a general resolution, which is a simple uh, majority. It's not to say it's particularly easy, uh, but we have had our first uh, property in Bendigo Street, uh, Richmond, uh, and um, I, I think eight or 10 apartments that have, um, uh, have been able to um, set up their solar, feeding their own meters with the benefit of our rebate. So, you know, I, I think it's something that there'll be increasingly um, uh, examples of. Yeah, fantastic. Interesting. I'm going to go away and um, Google that exact address or look that up um, just after we, after we do this. That's great. We'd, we'd um, like to see some of the things applied in other states. Yeah, yeah. And, and look, these are um, where it is really important that we see what's happening. So Victoria, there is a lot happening in Victoria. Victoria has been doing, um, you know, has been, has been leading the way on so many of these things. There are other great examples as well. The ACT um, has been doing some really, really great work in this space and there have been great programs in other states as well. We really want to take the opportunity in these types of programs and with our community and Renew to make sure that we're pushing for the sorts of changes that we should be seeing all around the country because, you know, everyone deserves a sustainable home, everyone deserves a healthy home and um, that should extend all across the country. I um, on on that on that note on my soapbox, um, it's we've come past seven thirty, so it's time for me to wrap up. I do want to finish. I, I want to first of all thank our wonderful wonderful panel, um, Stan and Dick. Thank you so much for taking part in this. It's been such a pleasure talking with you, and it's been such an interesting conversation. So thank you. I do want to give you the last word and um, ask, put you both on the spot, and just ask. Each of you, if there was one thing that you want people to take away from this session or when thinking about this issue as a landlord wanting to make their um, rental home more sustainable in general, um, what is the one thing that they should take away from this? And I am happy to put either of you on the spot to go first on that um, or feel free to volunteer. Can I do the politician's answer, Rob, and say uh, thank you. It's been an absolute delight. Really enjoyed uh, the conversation. And um, uh, thank you and congratulations to Renew and obviously to Fiona and, and the whole team there. I've had a long established relationship with um, Renew and ATA and obviously its predecessor organisations. You're doing fantastic um, work. The one thing I'd say is to be thinking about the future uh, and not in this kind of uh, romantic sense, but actually thinking about where is the future of um, residential of homes uh, and properties going. And for me, that's all electric. Um, and uh, the sooner you start thinking about what's my transition plan for that and how am I going to be a part of that future, um, then you can start thinking about how do you actually save for that or invest and what sort of incentives, et cetera, might be, um, might be available. 
Yeah, fantastic, fantastic. Yep. So true. I, I guess my parting thought would be a, a simple one. Um, a, a happy tenant is a good tenant and a long tenant is a good tenant. And uh, uh, like um, a landlord I, I know who rang me for some advice last week, their uh, stove had given up the ghost and so they opted to do some work to squeeze a new induction cooktop and uh, oven into the tenant and um, and when their, the tenant's lease came up, um, there was no increase in rent. It was just, um, you know, you're a great tenant. We want to hang on to you. Um, here's the new stove. Uh, thanks very much. You know, it was just that kind of nice, happy relationship where each understands the uh, the needs of the other, I think is something to aim for. Yeah, absolutely. Couldn't, I couldn't agree more. Um, and that's a really nice note to end it on. I just want to say that if there's one thing I take away from this, I'm inspired by the idea that we should be progressive, almost aggressive when pushing for these things um, is in language that Sam used. So that's something I'll take away from this. Um, so look, to Dick and to Stan, thank you so, so much for taking part in tonight's conversation. Um, to everyone who's attended, um, we hope it's been a useful session for you and we really thank you for taking part in this and in the whole um, week of sustainable of um, sustainable house day renters special week. Um, this is the final session in this week of of the program, but there will be more programs next year leading into sustainable house day in March 2023. And please do have a look at the links um, and the website to find out more about this. We want to thank once again our supporters and the and the organisations that have. Um, made it made an event like this possible. Um, so a big thanks to Natas, Your Home, Design for Place, Bank Australia, Zonin, Lighthouse Architecture and Science, Design Matters, Marybeck City Council, and Banyol City Council. Thank you so much for your support. On that note, I wish you all a very happy Thursday evening, and thank you so much for taking part. <laughs>